Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to actually probably give a, a more public side of biosecurity and uh, the work that I have done in the past in biosecurity, but also what we are currently doing now, and particularly in my role now that I'm actually in the, in the commercial world of actually putting some of this into practice. I'm going to, to uh, actually give an overview of what biosecurity means to reed fruits um, and how important biosecurity is, is to our future as a fruit exporter. Uh, the integral link between biosecurity, biosecurity and branding, and I think that's probably trying to put the human side on biosecurity, which is really important as we try and share how important uh, maintaining strong biosecurity is. I'm going to give you an insight into PIBA, um, of which I'll explain in more detail, and also raising awareness of biosecurity. And for those who are familiar with biosecurity, uh, the Bill Review clearly showed that biosecurity should be a shared responsibility and that's certainly something that we're trying to maintain um, and promote in Tasmania. Reed Fruits uh, was established in 1856 and has been exporting fruit for over 150 years. So whilst originally an, an apple orchard and an apple exporter, in the last 10-15 uh, years Reed Fruits has diversified into cherries. And the reason for the diversification is that cherries are a premium crop. It fits well into Tasmania's um, agriculture scene. It's the last, Tasmania's the last cherry producing uh, region in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and unlike many horticultural products, cherries are perishable. So unlike apples, which can be kept 12 months of the year, um, the niche of cherry sits into a certain window. We produce about 1,000 tonnes of cherries uh, in the Derwent Valley in Tasmania, sitting at the foothills of Mountfield National Park, um, and that will increase to about 1,500 tonnes with the current plantings, um, and we would expect that uh, we'll uh, extend that operation even further. We currently export to over 20 countries, including protocol countries, and I'll explain what a protocol country is shortly. Um, we export to Europe, uh, Middle East and our major market is into Asia. Unlike many producers, our, ex our strategy for marketing is based on export and I guess that also means that we're more reliant on strong biosecurity than a lot of other growers who rely on national markets. Protocol markets are those markets which the Department of Agriculture have negotiated with importing countries and it's uh, are more complex systems of export for us which uh, have a range of operating procedures which can be from orchard registration through to good agricultural practice uh, into taking it into the pack house and final uh, labelling, packaging um, and quarantining of product. Tasmania currently has access for cherries into Japan and South Korea purely as uh, Tasmania. Uh, and also into Taiwan and China as part of an Australian protocol for, uh, for cherries. And recently, in, no, in January, we also got access back into Thailand. Tasmania has the current advantage over our mainland uh, cherry growers because we have area freedom from fruit fly. And that's given us a significant head start into some of these countries. Um, Queensland fruit fly is... Uh, it, is a difficult pest because it is actually endemic to Australia, um, unlike many other fruit flies and many other pests and diseases. Uh, Tasmania's been very successful in gaining market access to some of these countries, and I know that we are the, not only the envy of many other cherry-producing states in, in Australia, but also many other horticultural commodities. But it's very much been a, a tripartite uh, response to market access with the uh, uh, Department of Agriculture heading up negotiations. Our state government also actively um, promoting strong biosecurity but also doing a lot of underpinning research. And industry also taking on the challenge by leading trade delegations over there and actually trying to promote a pull factor by trying to uh, uh, get importers and also negotiating um, with industry over there um, to, to smooth the pathway and uh, start markets for us. We are very reliant on ongoing area freedom from fruit fly, as well as other pests and diseases, and it is the single biggest risk in our, our own business. Um, and if 
uh, we do have an incursion or an establishment of fruit fly in Tasmania, it has absolute co drastic consequences for horticulture within the state. There are many benefits to uh, area freedom and I guess both at a macro and a micro level. Um, from a macro level, it's much easier to start market access negotiations uh, if you do have an area freedom and that is internationally recognised. From, uh, it's also regionally significant and uh, we're starting to see a lot of investment in the fruit industry again in Tasmania because of our area freedom from fruit fly, not only for cherries but for even the berry industry which is undergoing substantial um, expansion. We also have a much better quality product at the end of the growing process and the packing process and that's because we don't have an end treatment in Tasmania for controlling um, fruit fly, for instance, or other pests and diseases. Uh, our market niche is at the premium end. We cannot uh, compete in a commodity market. We have Chile, Argentina and other hemisphere, southern hemisphere producers um, who can, can all produce at a much cheaper uh, cost to us. So therefore we need to find a market niche and our niche is high, uh, large fruit, premium quality fruit which arrives in the marketplace fresh within three days of picking. It can actually be on sale in supermarkets. Um, and also we have greater acceptance by our trading partners and our customers by having that area of freedom. They actually recognise the value of it. From a micro level on farm, we obviously have reduced costs in trying to control. We don't have to control certain pests and diseases, so therefore our production costs are reduced and uh, that's very important when we're trying to main, remain competitive. We have less chemical usage, which has uh, food safety benefits and occupational health and safety benefits as well. And it's easier for us to meet international MRL standards, which is one of our um, challenges as we go forward. If uh, we were to take every single uh, spray uh, list from every country in MRLs and overlay them, we actually are left with one single solitary chemical that we can use. So managing our chemicals is very, very important when we're trying um, to plan our marketing strategy. We also have reduced costs because we don't have an end treatment, and I'm actually going to talk about some of the end treatment options, and we have much greater flexibility with export options. We can respond to markets very quickly. I don't really want to get into um, the pros and cons of, of the end treatments, but it is very important that uh, there are different options available and, and we are actually proactively looking at these because if uh, Tasmania does have a fruit fly incursion and, and does become established, we need to have um, an option for us to recommence exports as soon as possible. But uh, I've only chosen these four treatments. There are many more out there, and I haven't included things such as environment and cost in, into that table there. But um, it's very difficult trying to uh, negotiate market access um, for those regions which do have fruit fly. Um, and one of the key things for us is that when we're looking at fruit quality, we need to find an end treatment which suits uh, delivering premium quality high-end product as quickly as we can. So taking that into consideration, uh, many of the traditional treatments such as methyl bromide or cold treatment uh, aren't suitable options for us because it either uh, deteriorates fruit quality or takes a longer period of time. And one of the ones that we certainly are encouraging further investigation of is irradiation because we think that ticks many of the boxes um, for us as we move forward. Uh, interestingly, uh, New Zealand accepts irradiated product from Australia, tomatoes and mangoes, uh, and uh, they carry the sticker um, which actually says irradiated to protect our environment. So I think that's certainly a, a, a public way of, of trying to get greater acceptance for that product. Um, so uh, biosecurity enables, good biosecurity enables us to build a brand and that's be able to send excellent high quality product into premium markets. It helps us promote the clean and green um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. Uh, it enables us to comply with global programs such as Global, Back, global Gap, Green Eye and some of the UK and Europe supermarket requirements. 
And it also enables us to tell a story about our philosophy of fruit growing. Just want to touch on a, another group, PBAR, which is actually the primary industry biosecurity action alliance, um, was established, um, and that's actually our publication there, but it was established back in 2010 and has 15 peak bodies currently as members of PBAR. And we are very diversified members. As you can see there, and I haven't listed them all, but there's from the wine, the fruit, the salmon industries, nursery and garden, abalone, honey, bees, cropping, forestry, etc. We, uh, as I say, we formed back in April 2010 and, and uh, created a document called Biosecurity for Our Future. Um, and it was about maintaining Tasmania's area of freedom from pests and diseases. Um, from initially being formed as a lobby group, we have now become an advisory group. And, um, and our aim is to um, ensure that we can uh, maintain strong biosecurity within Tasmania. We're talking about branding, and I guess this is where it's integrally linked, is that uh, for many people who visit Tasmania, food is number one on their agenda. And all of our foods that are produced actually are at some way at risk with biosecurity, whether it be salmon, uh, beer, wine, fruit, abalone. Uh, once again, there are diseases knocking on our doorsteps which could threaten the viability of any of those industries. Tasmania's economic reliance on good biosecurity is, in, uh, is integrally linked to our food production, which is in turn integrally linked with hospitality industry in, in, uh, in Tasmania, our cafes and restaurants which promote our local produce, and it's driving tourism. 268,000 visitors to Tasmania September 2012 to September 2013 visited a food producer. Uh, it's about 20% of the visitors visited one or more food producer. So that's fairly significant, and that's not including the, the wine industry. Our premium produce is grown in a clean and green environment, and um, that's a cliche. I mean, I think we're all getting a bit sick of clean and green because it really doesn't have any substance. Biosecurity is now actually adding substance to that cliche. Uh, we've also got here the farm gate industries, a cellar door, agri-tourism. Agri-tourism is growing at a rapid rate. Uh, hiking and outdoor and extreme sports. Myrtle rust could have devastating consequences on Cradle Mountain, for instance. Uh, recreational tourists are coming, the fishermen, the golfers visiting Barn Boogle. All of them are enjoying what we have to offer, but also all of them are providing a biosecurity threat. And peri-urban farmers, uh, it's becoming well known that many people are buying land, small farm lots in Tasmania, um, to, uh, to escape the mainland and enjoy, uh, enjoy what life has to offer. Um, I've excluded the commercial, and, and I know we've talked on uh, you know, containers and uh, vessels and things like that. There's very strict controls over commercial importation of products. Um, but we're also finding in Tasmania that many of our biggest risks are coming from outside of those. Um, we've got uh, cruise ships, itinerant yachtsmen. We've got research vessels from Antarctic. Um, we've got hobby farmers who are thinking it's great to own five hectares but haven't got a clue about actually how to manage it. Um, and of course, with the internet, uh, courier and postal items uh, becoming a significant threat. And uh, we know that anecdotally, um, we're certainly hearing of a lot of cases of, uh, of products coming in which shouldn't be coming in. And even our, our bird owners and our gardeners and our dog breeders are, are also posing threats. PIBA's approach is to engage stakeholders. We're, in, we're talking to the tourism sector, the hospitality sector, the recreational sector, and also local councils. It's really interesting um, that when we've spoken to many of the local councils, none of them even understand biosecurity. They don't understand the consequences of it. So engaging that group's been really important. Uh, we're promoting biosecurity through multiple communication strategies. We're talking to Rotary Clubs and other forums. And we're highlighting the diversity of biosecurity, um, including public health and public pests, such as fire ants. Just in conclusion, biosecurity is more than protecting against incursion of pest disease. It's all about um, establishing a healthy economy. 
It defines a region, an industry and an economy. And we need to look at that big picture and, and that's very important in Tasmania's case. Uh, as Michael said earlier, biosecurity funding is insurance. It's, it's uh, just as we need insurance policies for everything else, we need it for biosecurity. Um, our biosecurity status is a comparative advantage. We often get talked about, about being protectionist, but in real cases, biosecurity is a comparative advantage. Uh, we've actually got a UK uh, investor who's established 15 hectares of berries in Tasmania. They looked at climate, they looked at water, they looked at biosecurity, and they um, established their, um, their farm there. And we need to refocus the message to engage the general population and talk about shared responsibility. Thank you.